So, James, you ready to kick off a podcast, my friend? Let's do yeah, it. I'm that excited. Sharp looking red jacket, bro. I didn't even get a chance <laughs> to ask you. Uh, um, where did you get that? Uh, is that a, is that a custom or Char- no? So most of my stuff is custom. This was the first time I was ever in Charleston, South Carolina, mm-hmm. on business. Um, I brought my wife along, and as I was having meetings, she was shopping in Charleston. <laughs> And went into a couple of different uh, shops for herself, but went into a couple of men's shops. Saw this, uh, brought me back the next day. I loved it, and uh, I don't wear it very often, so it's really truly you, special occasions. It is a special. And occasion. And I figured this was a special out. occasion. Well, that I, broke I appreciate it out. You, 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 you know, matching the aesthetic uh, that I keep <laughs> on the podcast. But so before I skip over introduction, so I'm with James Walsh, the EVP of Strategy and Growth at MedZoom. And I got everything right. Correct? Okay. Perfect. Awesome, man. And you're in from Atlanta. So again, thank you for the travel. It's been fun having coffee with you and getting to know you. And I'm excited to highlight what you're doing at MedZoom. Mm-hmm. But I guess before we start, the, the main thing is let's get to know you, James, a little bit. Your backstory. Got some really cool personal interests that we'll dig into. But uh, briefly, tell us who you are and, and how'd you get here today? Yeah, uh, super happy to be here. Um, I enjoy coming to Dallas uh, often, even though I am a Giants fan. Okay. Uh, I, right. I do enjoy making the trip to Dallas. It's a pretty cool city, uh, and I like Texas overall as a state. Um, yeah, no, uh, James Walsh from MedZoom. It's uh, lo- love the organization that you know I'm at right now. We're we're truly making some financial impacts, uh, you know, within the healthcare space um, right now, and it's. Well, you it's, know, it's I got an a soft spot time. for soft spot for insure tech, obviously, with what <laughs> I do. And when you showed me the platform, you know, I had obviously personal interest in it. I think maybe we'll figure out there's a strategic uh, relationship mm-hmm. that will develop as well. But I love highlighting cutting edge problem solving technology. And mm-hmm. I feel like you guys fit the bill. Um, and so I, and I think in, when we go into act two, we're going to go really deep into what is MedZoom? How's it work? Sure. Who's it for? All that. Um, but you know, one thing that you, you shared with me, actually two that I think are pretty cool, uh, but you're, you're a triathlete, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but you had kind of a, a letdown here recently with a race. So tell me what happened there. Man. I did. Uh, unfortunately, I, I am a back of the pack triathlete. Um, I do it to challenge myself. I definitely don't have the typical makeup and build of a, a successful or podium style, you know, long distance <laughs> triathlete. Uh, but no, I was uh, supposed to race in my uh, second full Ironman uh, a week and a half ago uh, in Ironman Florida. And unfortunately, about 36 hours um, before the race, I came down with a pretty bad fever, lung infection. and uh, Lung infection. And I made the decision to not even start. Yeah. Um, and, and I made the decision, uh, and it was a very emotional decision, um, but I made it because, one, I knew there was no way I would finish. Mm-hmm. And if I put myself in a position to potentially ruin someone else's day by being sick and you know, maybe you know, taking someone out, that's where I wouldn't be able to you know, really live with myself. So uh, I made the hard choice, and it was a very hard choice to actually so did, just not did start. you even fly down to Florida then? I was get, there. You were there. Okay, so the emotional decision, like that's got to be hard because you said, how long were you training for this race beforehand? With, uh, I mean, dedicated for that a good eight to nine months. Um, oh, you know, I always like to keep fit. Yeah. Um, so, you you know, I like to say, you know, when you're training for triathlons, you're just training for life. Yeah. Um, but, you know, a true dedicated training block for that, you know, you, you're building up and it's a good eight to nine months. Eight to, so eight to nine months and then you have to make a decision a couple of days beforehand. Scrap it. So what do you do? Like you just go, well, I can't run it and then look forward to a year down the road. Or what, what do you have to do after that? It's still to be determined. OK. Um, this, this was supposed to just be it. Uh, I was going to, you know, do number two and, and call it a, an Ironman career. Mm. Um, but we'll, uh, there's, there's now well, an I empty, feel like there's unfinished business. There's an empty yeah. void. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it's going to, it's going to be fixed. Uh, we, I've had some preliminary conversations with my wife, uh, with my coach and with, uh, some other friends, uh, as to how to potentially fill that void. It's okay. not going to be in 2023 though. It's not just okay. too many, uh, you know, kids stuff and life and business and, well, so how many hours a week would you be dedicating to training then when you're really preparing for a race? When you're in a really big block, it's probably anywhere between 16 to 18, okay. 16 to 20 hours a week of training. Okay. So, you know, two hours, three hours a day. Mm-hmm. Is that almost like a second job at that point? I mean, where you're, oh, dad's out training, you know, we'll see him, <laughs> we'll see him tonight. Or, or what, how, how are you getting your hours in without affecting the rest of your life? You know? No, it's, it's a really great question. 
A lot of the bike training is actually done at the house on an indoor trainer. Okay. You know, within a virtual world. Okay. Um, so it's pretty fun. You know, when the kids need me or they need something, they come out and, you know, they'll come into the training room that I, you know, that I have set up at the house. Uh, a lot of early morning swims. So are you swimming indoors or outdoors? Uh, indoors. I'm okay. lucky that I actually get to swim at the uh, Olympic Aquatic Center at Georgia Tech. That's cool. Um, it's pretty neat. Um, I can actually tell you the a really humbling experience, and it happened about two months ago, is uh, being in the pool early morning uh, with an Olympian who had just competed in Tokyo. Oh, yeah. Um, he's uh, a former UGA swimmer. Uh, I, I can say his name. He's uh, Nick Fink. Okay. Um, a breaststroker, I believe, and uh, seeing him just kind of warm up, uh, you know, in a 50-meter pool where they're going down and back and down, and I'm still on down. <laughs> it's uh, it's <laughs> so a pretty... not just lapping you, like double lapping you almost, which, yeah, I can imagine, though, that's what I... I told you about my soccer pass, right? Mm -hmm. And I got I got to a pretty high level, but that level I got to was still two and three and four or five levels below the truly top tier. And mm -hmm. it's it's amazing you think like maybe I wasn't technically speaking, statistically speaking, in the top one percent of players at my peak. Well, that top one percent to get to the top point one percent and the point zero one percent is literally night and day. I mean, mm -hmm. it's exponential, the ability level that those folks have. So I, I can imagine, right? Or it, if I was trying to run a, a 400 against, a, you know, somebody that runs a 400 in the Olympics, they're going to almost lap mm -hmm. me before I'm done. It's crazy. It was pretty unique. And uh, I, I think he finished like fourth or fifth in the either the 200 or 400 finals at the Olympics. No kidding. Wow. So, yeah, it, it was uh, really humbling to see. But really, I mean, awesome. Sp inspiring. Too, uh, I'm it, sure. Just yeah. to see someone at the absolute pinnacle of what the body can do and the pinnacle of what they've chosen to do, you know, with their life, it's, uh, you know, it's awe inspiring. Well, and I say of the things that I think your extracurriculars that were interesting, f oddly enough, I think there's even something more interesting, at least to me, than your triathlon experience is your, your scuba diver too. Mm -hmm. So how the heck do you get into scuba diving, man? Really? It's, uh, you know, it was a college graduation present to myself. Uh, you know, I'd always had a love of the water. Um, a love of the ocean and I just like to explore. And to me, you know, going 30, 50, 130 feet underwater, it's, you are going into an alien world Yeah, and it's, uh, it's the most peaceful and, uh, exhilarating at the same time experience. Um, I've been very lucky to dive at some um, truly amazing places. Uh, you You've know, been to ship, a shipwreck, haven't you? Or multiple <laughs> a lot, shipwreck? lot of wreck diving. Wow, that's crazy. Uh, east coast of South, uh, east coast of South Florida. Um, there's some amazing wrecks down there, and uh, you know, throughout the rest of the world, also. Did you find any treasure? At least that you want to disclose. <laughs> <laughs> so interestingly enough, um, last summer, we uh, I did a live aboard trip uh, from Miami over to the Bahamas. And in the Bahamas, there's actually a wreck in about 12 feet of water, depending on the tide, and it's called the Sapona. Um, it's a concrete shipwreck, and it was a World War II transport ship. And again, in World War II, there weren't a lot of, you know, metal was in high demand, so they were building these ships with concrete. Then for World War II, it was sunk, and it was used as target practice. Okay. I actually found in the sand, again, you know, World War II back in the 40s, you know, I found uh, bullets no in kidding. the sand. And I actually did find uh, a one carat diamond stud um, because a lot of people go to the Sapona in the Bahamas for day trips. They jump off their boats, they snorkel, they swim around it. So I was lucky enough to find a one carat diamond stud in, yeah. in the sand right well, around the I was thinking maybe a little bit older treasure than no. that, but still, that's a win. What's funny, you tell that in story no that coins. triggered a memory of mine when I was at a trip a sales trip for when i was at sun life we went to mm -hmm. st thomas and somebody there uh a lady i think it was a, a spouse of one of the sales reps she lost her wedding band or one of her wedding band i think it was her engagement ring mm -hmm. but funny enough it happened so often at this beach that they got a local guy that basically he does his job is to <laughs> find people's lost wedding rings and he did he literally they kind of showed him roughly where it was he was popping in and out of like uh you know just basically at the shore but he was popping in and out and looking and he had his metal detector mm -hmm. lo and behold he found this person's engagement ring amazing like, that is wild dude uh, but anyways that's super cool and as you're telling me stories about your diving i'm mm -hmm. like i'm not a big water guy you, you you seem to lean into it i'm like eh, if i can't see the bottom i have no interest in, in being in the water but like viscerally thinking about 
diving. Like, have you ever had a, a scare or had a, like a, a risky moment or anything like that that happened? Never. Okay, good. Um, good. I, I'd say in, in my entire life, and I couldn't even tell you how many dives I've done. I stopped counting when I got to 500, and that was a really long time ago. Mm-hmm. Um, there have been a couple times where, you know, I've been at depth and something felt off. Mm. Can't, and still to this day, I can't say what was off. But, you know, I look at if I'm, you know, with a dive buddy or if, you know, you're in a, a guided trip, you know, I mean, I've done it twice. I looked directly at, you know, it was a, I did a guide both times and I said, I'm okay, I'm going up. Mm. And they kind of look at me. I'm like, no, I'm okay, but I'm still going up. And for whatever reason, you know, and I've always. Instinct, I guess. It, yeah. That's what it was. Yeah. It was just something isn't right. And it was both, uh, both times it was my first dive of the day. And I got on, you know, to do the second dive of the day with, with no issues whatsoever. But uh, just gut instinct said something doesn't feel right. Go up. You can always dive another day. Um, yeah. You know, there's some risk involved. And you have to, it's, I, I look at diving a little bit like I look at, you know, business and, you know, my career. It's, you have to be, you know, intentional. You have to be, a, you have to plan what you're trying to do. And then you do have to execute on that plan. Um, because if you don't and you make a mistake, bad things potentially could happen. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you put yourself in a bad spot. Well, that's, yeah, that's just it. And like, I, I think you're competing right now for the most interesting man in benefits. I, uh, I had Craig Julian, he's the CEO no of, uh, of HealthSmart. I don't know if mm-hmm. you know him. And he, he's not only a skydiver and does like formation skydiving, he's also like a mountaineer and a triathlete. So he wins. He's, he, he's, he's pretty awesome. Like he's a, and I didn't know any of this going into the, the sit down. So that was a lot of fun, but let's, let's get into the benefits talk now and sure. the sure tech talk. Uh, I do want to career wise kind of lead us up to today working for MedZoom. So mm-hmm. I saw on your CV on, on LinkedIn, you started in the legal field as a legal <laughs> assistant. So how the heck did that happen? Right? Yeah. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Okay. Um, you know, Post college, uh, I wasn't exactly sure um, what I wanted to do. Uh, I did think that at some point I'd want to go to law school, but I knew I wanted to take a year off. So I did actually work as a paralegal um, for a fair, fairly large firm uh, based out of the Northeast. Um, was we're the defense team for a, a pretty large pharmaceutical company, <laughs> um, and it was a products liability case. So working with a lot of you know first, second, third year associates. And I mean, truly established, um, you know, partners who were, you know, extremely well-known litigators within the the, the, the legal space was uh, a really interesting foray in, into it. Um, as we can see, I didn't go to law school. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I went a completely different direction. Um, but yeah, it's uh, legal was interesting. You know, you you truly got to see a lot of different aspects of business. You know, within just through that legal field. Once it was there a moment where you go, this isn't for me, or did you always kind of know that it wasn't really going to be a long-term career? There's probably not one thing that I can put my finger on that says, you know, this is for me or this isn't for me. But I knew I, I enjoyed what I did, but I didn't have a passion for yeah, it. Yeah, that's fair. And I, I just think by not loving it, there was no way I would have been able to go to law school and then, you know, do it. I can, so I can, I can relate to that. When I was a claims adjuster at Liberty Mutual, a PNC claims adjuster, mm-hmm. and I was handling like slip and fall claims and trucking accident claims. I mean, there's just one too many frivolous claims that you're like, man, I know this didn't happen because I was covering some of those, the lower end of the spectrum motels. Um, <laughs> so give you an idea. And you just got tired of fighting with lawyers that you knew were just trying to squeeze a thousand bucks out of this case or, you know, whatever. And mm-hmm. it was just taking on anything and everything where I just like, I can't do this for a career. This is, I've, like I said, no passion for it. It was a great job. Liberty Mutual was a great company. It had nothing to do with them. It was just the nature of the work didn't inspire. It was me. a job, not a career. It was a job. And it was a, my first job too, yeah. right? So I think we all have that first job. We just checked the box to, to be employed and gainfully. <laughs> so, so when did you get into what we would consider kind of the insure tech and benefits world? Actually, fairly recently. Okay. Um, you know, my background is more in SaaS technology uh, with a, a center around HR, uh, human resources, SaaS okay. technology. Um, so that goes back to probably 2007 uh, when I truly got into what I would call, you know, a, a sales world. Okay. Um, when I moved from New Jersey down to Atlanta, 
Um, I was working within uh, with ADP. Uh, everyone knows who ADP is, uh, and it was uh, an HR platform uh, with some services tied to it. And that kind of gave me my first experience into you know human resources from a tactical standpoint. Um, and then that kind of evolved into some other you know business ventures that I took, and that got me into technology. I was just asking. I feel like ADP is the entry point for a lot of salespeople. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, I don't want to, is it cutthroat? Is that a good enough, is that the appropriate term? I know it's, it's difficult. I don't know if cutthroat is the right word, but what, how would you describe? This podcast is brought to you by True Captive Insurance, a premier medical stop loss captive for employer groups ranging from 25 to 1,000 employees. True Captive believes in healthcare that is personal and insurance that isn't complicated. That's why they take a white glove approach making it easy for employer groups to transition into a program built specifically for them. Check them out at truecaptive.com. It's actually not a bad word. So when I started there, it was a fairly new platform and solution Mm -hmm. that I'm not going to say we were beta testing it, but we were a very small niche within the greater scope of ADP. So I think when you looked at the, um, you know, the, the true payrolls, um, sale. Mm -hmm. Yes, that was very cutthroat, completely commoditized. There was definitely more value, um, you know, in what we were trying in our message and what we're trying to do. And I think throughout the entire country, there are only about 48 of of us. Okay. So we were very, very small, um, you know, beta solution. Um, but it went, it, it worked. And, uh, I think to this day, it's uh, it's grown substantially within ADP. Well, that's cool, man. Yeah, and I just I only point to it because I know some mm-hmm. folks that have worked at ADP and made really nice careers out mm-hmm. of it. But they started there, and it was like young guy out of college or gal out of college. Here's what you do. Here's how you go knock on doors. Here's how you get around security. <laughs> All those things that you have to do to win some business. And you're mentioning 48 reps across the country. I was telling you I met with a PEO guy uh, the other day, mm-hmm. and I think they have something like 50 reps in Dallas. Like to give you an idea of how much saturation is in that space. So I imagine it was challenging, but the skills that you learn, the resilience you probably learn um, going through that, was it a really good training ground for your sales career? Absolutely. Yeah. ADP was definitely a good company. I'd say where I really, you know, probably hit my stride in terms of my career and where, you know, my knowledge and the ability to run a good process took off is actually when I did make a transition from ADP over to a, you know, a PEO um, that was called Trinet. Um, That was I was very lucky to have some amazing leadership and mentors at that company. Um, and the PEO space, it, there is a benefits focus to it, Mm -hmm. but the way that we did everything, it was more technology and HR consulting where benefits were kind of the afterthought. And and that's why, you know, so I I had a good knowledge or I I should say, I thought I had a good knowledge (laughs) of healthcare uh, when I joined uh, MedZoom about three and a half years ago, but realized very quickly I knew nothing. Yeah, as I say, because you're probably dealing with a much different size spectrum with MedZoom than you would be at uh, at Trinet, right? Because I mean, PEO is what sub fifty, twenty lives. How many? It was it was a lot size? of small business. Yeah. Um, I would say most our average, you know, where I was was probably in that fifty range. Okay. Whereas now with MedZoom, we're an enterprise level platform, mm-hmm. uh, and we're talking about tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of you know users per per deal. Per deal. So it's, okay. it's very, very different. Yeah. So what was there? Was there like, oh, my gosh, was there a moment when you go, I don't know anything about these large group space or when you said you thought I knew benefits, right? What was what was were you uncovering as you were getting into these larger groups? So it's it's not so much. The size isn't what you know, the size has never scared me. I think what I didn't know is I actually I thought I truly understood or had a grasp of how healthcare worked in this country. And I didn't. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, within the, the space now, I mean, again, we're technology. Yeah. Um, we're not out there selling insurance or, or health care. Um, our clients are third-party administrators, uh, regional health plans, brokers, and all of those folks are using our platform and our technology to service their members right, right. and really deliver um, a true white label experience. So the members have one place to go to interact with all the different, what we have seen in the past, siloed components of healthcare that traditionally weren't talking with each other. And our platform, you know, brings some cohesion to it and uh, allows the members um, 
you know, really that, that really nice experience where they can go on the front end, on right? the front yeah, end. That, that's the key thing is you mentioned like not a benefits company or a tech company. Most people, yeah. when they think of insurance, it's right. Like what's my deductible, what's my copay, mm-hmm. what choices am I, am I being offered? And what is, what should I choose based on my needs and the cost of it, which everybody focuses on the cost through premium, right? The real cost is the cost of actual consumption of healthcare. And uh-huh. they don't, most people don't see that because they have their out of pocket. They have their maximum out of pocket. Mm-hmm. Everything else is the employer's responsibility. And so they don't really know maybe what they're costing an employer. And so you guys are bringing the front end of it we are. as well. So, so let's, let's go and say, hey, sure. what is MedZoom before I feel we move on to the rest of that? No, that of course. So we yeah. can do that. But before I jump into yeah. that, I, I want to say a line that I'm stealing from a friend, Dutch Rojas. Oh yeah. And yeah. it's, if you want to pay less for healthcare, you have to pay less for healthcare. And getting to know Dutch over the last couple of years uh, and hearing that line quite often from mm-hmm. him, it just resonates. Because I, I look at healthcare as a whole and why is it the way it is? And again, I have a layman's view of it. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I didn't grow up in this space. And my take on it is why is it this way? Why do you have to hand over a plastic ID card that everything behind that card is hidden. You have no idea what something costs. Mm -hmm. And the system has been set up that way so the members never know. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing now where with some of this, you know, price and transparency um, laws that are coming out, it's aimed to educate or hope, urge the consumer to become a better, you know, or or educate themselves on how to be a consumer of actual healthcare and understand that there are different prices and costs for the same procedure, depending on where you go. Yep. Um, well, we have that mutual, a mutual friend, Marshall Allen, that's, uh, (laughs) he's out there being an advocate for the, the average American, right. That is, is not in our industry, doesn't know any of the things that you and I have been exposed to, but are now becoming aware through a balanced bill or some sort of mm-hmm. egregious, you know, even exploitation of them during an, a hospital stay or something like that and going, what do I do? And so he's arming people with what to do retrospectively or retroactively. Mm-hmm. But then the front end is really where I think the opportunity lies, which is where you guys sit, right? If you can intercept, or again, if our platform enables the, the administrators, the health plans to potentially intercept the member before they make a bad financial decision. Yes. And it's a bad financial decision, not only for the plan, but for that individual member. Um, I mean, I don't know the exact statistic, but it's, you know, one in four people couldn't afford a $500 healthcare mm-hmm. bill right mm-hmm. now. And if you have the ability to eliminate that and people can go get the care they need when they need it, and it doesn't impact them financially negatively. I mean, that's that's the that's the utopia, right? If yeah. you can solve that, I feel like you know that that's where you can start making some true inroads in you know breaking this system um, as to the way. Well, it's you mentioned been. you said it like earlier, like it's intentionally keeping individuals in the dark about what things cost, right? Mm-hmm. So most of the time, even if you wanted to know in normal circumstances. You're going to go to a service provider. You're going to go to a hospital. You're going to go to a surgical center. They might roughly tell you what it costs, or they might tell you, hey, we don't know until we bill your insurance. Mm -hmm. They know what they're going to bill based on what the contract says, but they have no idea what you're going to pay Mm -hmm. or what your employer is going to pay or what the insurance carrier is going to cover. And so everybody is effectively left in the dark. And it's like, hey, we'll just wait and we'll find out later. And it could be $100,000, it could be $5,000, and you don't know. And it's not just the medical side, it's the pharmacy side as well. I talked to a guy Mm -hmm. the other day, which they're kind of, they've set up a technology which allows them to effectively um, wholesale, you know, dollar for dollar, give away the drugs for cost, um, for generic drugs, but then they're the back room, the engine with the robotics to just mm-hmm. to fill those prescriptions. But when you find out how much spread pricing is in a prescription, and it actually costs you more money to swipe your card for a drug that you might be able to get a penny a pill if you just got it at cost, yeah. it's insanity, right? But you've inserted this middleman and the contracts that they've negotiated on your behalf, mm-hmm. and you have no idea what either side is going to be paying. It's crazy. It, it's, it's totally crazy. Um, I've actually... You know, one of the unique things about our platform that allows people to do is sometimes eliminate the network. Because as you said, within the PBM space, you have that spread pricing behind the scenes where you just, you know, everything's going to be inflated. Well, if you can align, and again, it's, why can't healthcare be like any other transaction? Mm -hmm. If I want to go get a bottle of water, I go into a store, 
I pick up the bottle of water, and I go pay for it. Mm -hmm. I use a payment credential. And you see a sign that says 99 cents as you grab (laughs) it out of the the shelf. Exactly. And that's healthcare does have the ability for that to happen. And I've proven this myself, even with, you know, within the last couple of weeks, I called up, um, it was actually a foot doctor prior to the race. I had a little <laughs> bit of a foot injury, needed to see someone just to make sure it wasn't broken. Um, I called up and I said, what's your cash price for an office visit? I'd never been there before. And they gave me the office visit price. I went, I got some x-rays and they just, I asked them, Hey, listen, you know, I'm paying cash today, which I did can you just invoice me after the fact for the x-rays? And they said, yeah, no problem. So instead of submitting a claim, you know, Mm -hmm. to an administrator where it would hit a rate card on a contract negotiation between an insurance company and a provider that has nothing to do with the member, they just simply billed me $36 for three x-rays that I was more than happy to pay $36 for. Well, and that's, that kind of speaks to, you know, why I, why I'm a believer in DPC as well, direct primary care Mm -hmm. is because it's pulling a lot of the routine claims out of the insurance equation altogether, which is what insurance wasn't obviously originally designed for. In your circumstance, those might have been a few hundred dollars, thousand dollars if billed through insurance, then negotiated down, right, 50% discount, and they pay a couple hundred bucks or whatever. But $36 is the cost passed on to you. You pay directly. It's outside of the, the spectrum of insurance. It doesn't hit the plan, doesn't affect the renewal, yada, 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 right? Like if we were to do that, most of the time, rather than go through insurance, you would see the cost curve come down just by very nature of reduction yeah. of claims, right? So that you guys are doing that to a degree, but let's let's talk about sure. MedZoom, the solution. Categorize it for me. What do you consider yourselves in the insure tech space? We look at ourselves as a technology platform that has the ability to improve the financial outcomes for both plans and members. Okay. So that's that's the fifty thousand yeah, foot view. Yeah. You know, I think if you drop down a little bit lower and go into the weeds, it's a true white labeled member experience. What we found is that, and again, our clients are third party administrators, health plans, brokers, Mm -hmm. you know, all that are selling out to employer groups directly. And what we find is that there are thousands of different flavors of health plans. Some have telehealth solutions baked in, some have specialty PBMs, Mm -hmm. some have direct primary care, some are reference-based pricing, some are PPO plans, some are no network plans. And what our platform allows the administrator to do is bring all those unique components of that health plan, white label it in one singular experience, so the member has one place to go. They can interact with a benefits wallet. They can interact you know, to find care. They can align with the provider on what a price is. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, and all these things are what the platform is capable of. And it's, again, I like to say I'm I'm the layman, you know, within healthcare here. I defer and I look at the administrators and the brokers and the plans as the experts. They know what they're looking to achieve and they've aligned with the correct solutions to hopefully lower, you know, financial and plan cost for those members we just make them easy to execute on their vision. Yeah, yeah. Because the platform allows so many unique experiences um, and unique ideas from those experts to now be deployed out into the into the member Let's groups. say, like, you can have the best strategy in the world, but if you don't have a way for a member to Im- interface with mm-hmm. something that allows the execution of that strategy, because it's one thing for a broker to go explain to the CFO and the head of HR, here's what we're going to do, and this is why it's great. Yeah. Now all that information has to trickle down to the member. The member has to have constant communication, and then they have to have easy access Mm -hmm. to now go deploy the solution. If you can't check all those boxes, the best strategy in the world is going to fall flat, right? Because you don't have utilization, you don't have an engagement. So how are you getting these members incentivized either through a carrot or a stick or both or just quality of experience? How do you get them Mm -hmm. in the platform actually using it? Yeah, it's great. And that's where a a lot of times the administrators and the brokers are so key. You know, we're rolled out in a number of different facets, um, you know, a lot through open enrollment meetings, uh, through ongoing, you know, drip campaigns, you know, to download. But where we've seen, you know, the best adoption, and it was, you know, a couple of clients did this. One, first and foremost, they eliminated the plastic ID cards. Okay. And they just said. You don't get a card anymore. No, right? yeah. you, you can order one, but you, Mr. or Mrs., um, you know, healthcare member, it's your financial responsibility to actually pay for that card. Um, so you go full digital and you get adoption. Like, uh, I think we saw in plans that are in clients that have done that, you're looking at 70 plus percent 
download and enrollment within the first week. Yeah. So, I mean, truly great adoption. The other is, and we have a lot of clients that have, you know, work with third party um, care navigation or concierge teams. Mm -hmm. And what we've seen a lot of times is, you know, on plan year renewal or plan launch, there's always some proactive reach out from those care teams to the members, introducing them. Hey, listen, I'm going to be your care navigator this year. Uh, if you need to interact with me in any way, do so through the application. Here's how you get the application on your phone right now, or here's the, you know, the web portal that you log into. Here's the information I can send you about it right now. So even though that's not us, you know, it's a third party that's part of the platform now yeah. because it's part of the health plan. They're the ones that, and they understand that if you can get the members to call them, that's when they shine. And so it, it's a great symbiotic relationship between us as the overlying technology company and all the other vendors that we've integrated into the platform mm -hmm. at, you know, at the request of the, the plan. Obviously. Well, it's a dashboard, right? Like if I'm shopping for an, I mean, I can almost envision like it's like the Amazon shopping experience. I log in, search for what I need. Here's all the vendors that pop up. I evaluate them based on rankings and based on price. And then mm -hmm. I make a purchasing decision based on that. And they've simplified from search to, you know, getting that package mm -hmm. on your doorstep. They've simplified that every step of the way. It sounds kind of like applying at least the same logic. Yeah. It's a marketplace. To, yeah. It's a marketplace, right? So, so talk to me about some of the data that's coming in there. So like, who are you having to integrate with on the front end in order to populate the right information inside of uh, the portal? This podcast is sponsored by PlanSight. PlanSight is a technology for employee benefits brokers to more efficiently manage their RFP process for any group size, all funding types, and over 20 benefit lines and point solutions. PlanSight is the only end-to-end -end RFP technology on the market today. Let's modernize your RFP process together. Check us out at PlanSight.com. Yeah, the best part is it's whoever our client wants us to. Okay. Uh, you know, we don't, we do not make the decision as to what vendors our clients use. Yeah. Um, you know, they have the ability to do that. So, I mean, here, a perfect example right now is, you know, with the CAA compliance laws that are going into effect for January 1st and all the machine-readable files. So having the ability to ingest all those machine-readable files so the members have the ability to search, um, you know, for the top 500 CPT codes and understand what the unit cost is for that health care, what the plan's paying for, what the member responsibility is. You know, we've in, we, we do have our own, um, you know, third-party solution that we've integrated with that has access to all the machine-readable files. But then we do actually get them from our clients as well. Okay. We always want to make sure that we have multiple data sources coming in. Um, and then, you know, there are a lot of different, you know, layers on top of that, you know, to build out the marketplace. What we find is, you know, a lot of our clients have done some really amazing work and they have, you know, their own direct contracts and bundles, which they want to publish to the members. This is now a tool that allows their members to have access and see, wow, I can truly shop for care. Or most importantly, I can talk to my care navigator who has the ability to see, yeah. this is the care you, Mr. or Mrs. Member need also. I can tell you to go here, the plan is, you know, done an amazing job by, you know, marking this as a preferred vendor, building a relationship. The plan is going to cover 100% of your your cost. It doesn't cost you to go get this knee replacement surgery if you go here. Yeah. Um, you know, so we a lot of our clients have done that. But then we work with a lot of what we like to call content providers as well, that their job is to go out and secure bundles and you know direct contracts and we aggregate all of those companies together in the platform as well so our our clients um, you know have access to it well so how do you simplify though the shopping experience for the person that's not as sophisticated in the healthcare world doesn't understand cpt codes like do you have some normal language they can search for my knee hurts you know or like yeah how, it, how does it work if <laughs> you type in knee it's gonna populate you know all the okay. all the different procedures you know that that you could potentially need or have access yeah, yeah. But again, being fairly new to healthcare, I like to look at myself as the everyday healthcare user where you just don't know. And that's where you have to talk to experts. And you, and that's what I love so much about our clients is most of them are working with, you know, true like nurse practitioner care navigators yeah. in conjunction with their health plans to hold the hands of the members advise them on what they could potentially need, advise them on where to go. To me, you know, it's, you see it with direct primary care as well. You have that great relationship with the DPC provider and then they're trying to steer you out afterwards. It, you're, 
you're we're seeing this evolution now. Yeah. Um, but I also like to say it's it's the work of like a Marshall Allen, you know, trying to educate consumers. It's he the work he's doing is you know phenomenal, mm -hmm. and uh, I like to see more of it. And you hope that sooner rather than later everyday Americans take the ownership to educate themselves on this industry. Well, what I like about mentioning Marshall, like what he's doing with his academy, right? His ability to actually interact with videos and mm -hmm. media content. And he's like, continue, I pres presume we'll be continually updating that with new content over time where you can subscribe to it. And it's like, hey, there's actually a place I can go to educate myself in snackable sty style content, which is cool. Like if you don't want to read the book, go watch videos instead. He's basically meeting people wherever they are and however they want to consume that information. It's awesome, man. I mean, what he's doing is sort of, philanthropic, although mm -hmm. obviously it's a business as well. And I, I love that. What I was going to ask you though, is like, do you have anything that's proactive in nature where if you find somebody's like searching for something like might be serious, right? Like, do you have a way that that triggers a response or an outreach or something like that? Or we, how does that work? We actually do. And it's, it's pretty unique. It's, it's one of the newer initiatives that we came okay. up with, uh, probably over the summer. Um, so it's in beta right now, but it's going to be, you know, rolling out at some point in 2023. We have visibility um, to see what members are looking for. Mm -hmm. So, like, you can know if someone, you know, is searching, you know, knee or cortisone or something. You know, you know that there's something that's happened. Yes. And we now have the ability to give that information to a case manager, um, usually at the plan administrator level, who can proactively reach out to that member just to see what's going on. And when you're able to interact with members proactively as opposed to reactively, yes, exactly. you can save so many negative healthcare, um, you know, interactions. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you can make sure that they're getting the best care they need when they need it. Uh, if you have the ability to, you know, negotiate on price, even with the provider to get them a better price for that care, uh, it's having that well, how many know, how many frame. interventions could have happened far down the care continuum had there been a trigger had there been a proactive outreach versus situations you and i were over coffee talking about situations where people might be hospitalized hospitalized for months then we find out afterwards the stop loss carrier gets hit with a couple hundred thousand dollar reimbursement request and you're like well hold on like we didn't even know somebody was in the hospital and then all of a sudden we're getting billed for this what could we do to prevent that exact situation mm -hmm. from happening. And so that's kind of what the target is there, right? You said how many, it's infinite. It's infinite, yeah. <laughs> you, you just don't know. Because again, we've been working within the same system for however many years now. Mm -hmm. And it's, the, the system is, has been built against the consumer so they don't know what anything costs. And, you know, you, you can see you can just see the profits of, you know, a lot of the big healthcare companies. And I'm not saying it's bad. I'm not, you know, I'm definitely not, you know, saying anything negative about some of the, even the big insurance carriers, you know, there's probably a lot of good that they do. Of course. It's not, it is, yeah. it's not all bad, yeah. but I, I think if you can make some subtle changes mm -hmm. or significant tweaks, however you want to look at <laughs> yeah. it. Depending on um, where you sit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, you know, that that's, they also need to be, hopefully part of the solution Absolutely. going forward yeah. because there's so much power that they have within the healthcare journey for members. Yeah. Um, well, and John, that's, I mean, so like it's, it's, it's easy to pick on a buka, right? And it's sometimes unfairly. I think most people just want to target it. And then sometimes it is fairly as well. Some of the mm -hmm. arrangements of what we've just talked about. I do think you're, I suspect you're correct. I've had this thought recently that the idea of a network might kind of change or go away. away. You mentioned direct contracting. You guys are doing something interesting, though, with payments as well, right, where the member's actually able to pay at the point of sale. So mm -hmm. how, how does that work? Because I think the closer we get to a cash equivalent, the more like any other purchase decision is going to be made. So how, do you, how are you guys doing that piece? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And it actually came from client interaction. Um, a client came to us and said, hey, listen, you know our plan. It's a reference-based pricing plan. But within the geography we're working within, we're encountering a lot of friction. You know, the, the facilities and the providers just say, you know, we, we don't accept that. Um, because from the provider standpoint, you know, right, wrong, or indifferent, they may have the wrong perception as to what reference-based pricing is mm -hmm. and how they're going to be reimbursed. They may have had a bad, uh, you know, interaction with, with a specific company in the past, and it just left a bad taste in their mouth. What, 
what we've seen is this though when the client said we have the ability to get our members into these facilities if we can pay them in full at the time of service mm -hmm. can you help mm -hmm. luckily we could you know as a technology company we developed one of our solutions and we call it a spc card or a single payment credential and we've been able to create you know single use virtual credit cards that are loaded with plan dollars so a member has access to it within their application. They can go, and again, it's a known scheduled procedure. Right. So so does it employ – I want to ask the logistics because sure. this is very interesting. I want to make sure I understand how it works. So what does it trigger for this to get approved so that my card will get loaded? How, how, what are the steps that need to be taken to do that? All that's done at the, the plan level, whether that be the plan administrator, um, the broker, who, whoever is determining that, yes, we, we need to get this member care. It's approved by the plan. We're proactively reaching out to the provider, understanding, hey, we're going to send you a member paid in full, not reference-based mm -hmm. pricing. So it's just a closed-loop transaction. What's your cost for this procedure that they're going to need? When, we align, when, when the plan aligns with the provider on that cost, uh, they simply put in a request to MedZoom. Uh, we create that single-use virtual credit card. It's loaded with plan dollars, and that member just simply goes and uses that Can virtual you, credit card. Do you guys card. actually draw from an employer account? Or, like, I don't know if you get too much into the weeds on the payment cash flows, but I'd be interested what you can't share, of course. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I, well, I'm transparent in it. Um, MedZoom actually has the ability to float Front, yeah, the money yeah, yeah. to our clients. Because, again, it's when you're looking at plan reserve funds, it's a – <laughs> it, it's <laughs> sticky because who owns it? Sometimes they're held at the employer level. Uh -huh. Sometimes they're held at the TPA yeah, level. Yeah. And you just, you, when you have access, you need access to those funds. So if a member needs care quickly and it takes time to pull money from this account, to get it over to us, to put it on a card, we simply wanted to eliminate that friction point for the members and the plans and say, all right, we have access to float vehicles. We can utilize this. Nice. We'll, we'll, settle up at the end of the month well that's dude that's brilliant Make it a little bit simpler it, yeah i mean yeah fair enough but it's so that also solves for the main detriment or downside if you will of reference-based pricing is the potential for a balance bill afterwards mm -hmm. or a provider to say no and there's dissatisfaction for everybody yep. in the outcome there so what you've done is got it to where member can swipe a card provider's happy they get paid the day of Employer's happy because they got the right pricing. Member doesn't even have to worry about it, right? Mm -hmm. Or they're out of pocket, I guess, would be just swiped alongside of that. And then, boom, everybody in that equation wins. That, that to me, is one of the most brilliant things of what you've described to me right now is solving for the, the payment problem mm -hmm. um, and then making a payment feel exactly like it would be to go buy a shirt at the store. Uh, that's so cool. Well, I'm, I know there's a lot more to it than that, but uh, hopefully, you know, at least summarize the value proposition there because I think it's really, really strong. There's a lot to it, but the key is this. To the member, it's as simple, it, it, it's a similar process. Mm -hmm. You're going to a healthcare provider, you're getting the care you need, and you're showing a card. The only difference is you're not showing an insurance card. You're simply showing a payment card that has a MasterCard logo on it. Mm -hmm. And what we found out is this through tens of thousands of transactions that we've done over the last 22 months that we launched this, 100% acceptance. Yep, believe it. Um, providers, apparently, they just like to get paid. Well, think about, <laughs> you, know, you know, jokingly, right? But think <laughs> about if I'm waiting 60, 90, 120 days, or there's a dispute that drags out for a very long time, or I'm even just right off a loss because I never got paid, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely, I'm going to take a significant amount less if you pay me today right now. as a provider right now, right? Because then you could even lower your administrative burden as a provider with staff, right? That's not having to chase down insurance bills all the time, right? I mean, hopefully this is scalable. I mean, I mean, obviously it is, right? Like, because that could do a, a lot to help solve for the payment problem. Exactly. And again, it's, it's just a tool. Yeah. It, it's a tool that's there when needed for our clients. It's not changing plan design. It's not taking, if it is a reference-based pricing plan, we're not replacing a reference-based pricing company within sure. that. There's, it's collaboration between all the different solutions working together to provide the best financial outcome and that best experience for the member. Mm -hmm. You're eliminating the friction when needed. And the answer is, well, can I go there? The answer is always yes. Because if reference-based pricing can't handle it, we now know through tens of thousands of instances, 
providers accept cash. They really like that MasterCard logo. Yeah, absolutely, dude. And, and that's just how it's how it's worked. And on the post analysis of all the transactions, um, and th- this is what our clients tell us because they do that analysis on their own. Um, they say that it's usually about a forty percent unit cost reduction in price mm-hmm. compared to say that postpaid claim scenario within that network. Well, that, so what I, I told you this was timely because we mentioned the CAA and mm-hmm. I do want to ask you some about that. Like the, the, the episodes actually released, even though we're shooting this now in what mid November um, and this may come out in January. If anybody's listening and wants to go back to the episodes we did about the CAA, one of the things that those guys at agility partners mentioned was mm-hmm. that they're thinking upwards of 30% overall reduction. When, when yeah. you pull, peel back the layers, just chopping off the top, we might see about a 30 or more percent reduction versus, you know, a traditional PPO network with the discounts and the way those arrangements work. I suspect it's actually higher. You mentioned 40% unit cost reduction, It's probably closer, could be 50, who who knows uh, when this thing plays out. But imagine if we've got a $4 trillion industry or whatever the number is, and we can chop off 20% or 30%, we're talking a trillion plus dollars, uh, perhaps waste in the system if we just pay for it in a smarter way. So can I, I think we went 50,000, 30,000, let's go 10,000, let's sure. talk employer, and then we'll go sea level and talk one individual using the, the platform. What is the right employer profile? Like what kinds of employers benefit immediately from using this platform? We're on a mission to partner with the most innovative companies in America to fix health benefits one plan at a time. NavMD has created a blueprint that delivers world-class benefits to 155 million Americans. Better benefits starts with data intelligence. Our platform is empowering the next generation of advisors to zero in on opportunities to optimize the plan, build the right team, implement proven strategies and solutions. Join us on our journey to revolutionize health benefits. Let NavMD put you a step ahead Potentially everyone and all. Okay. Um, Again, as I said, we're enterprise level. So we're usually, the buyer of our platform is usually the broker or the plan administrator. Mm -hmm. We're not going directly to the employer group specifically. Yes, yes. But I can tell you that within the platform, we have every type of demographic of business profile uh, from one employee, employers, up to, you know, tens of thousands uh, employee employers all using our platform. Um, Dead matter, fully insured, self-funded. Uh, we do see, we do have fully insured business on the platform. Most of where we can make the best impact w- is within that self-funded mm-hmm. space. Mm-hmm. Um, but we, we again, we have a, a bunch of captives that we work with as well. So that's why you have that ones, one and twos, you know, on the platform sure. also. Well, are there any restrictions, right? Any any networks that say no or, you know, carriers that won't allow for the utilization of this tool or won't work with you? I mean, you don't have to name names, but are there situations where it just doesn't fit? There's always going to be a one-off situation, but I can say within the, you know, four, four and a half years we've been live and the multiple thousands of actual employer groups that are on the platform, we've never come across any real resistance of saying, no, we're not going to do that. We won't integrate. Um, Because again, you're trying to solve the problem. We like to think that we've aligned ourselves with the types of clients and folks in the industry that are all trying to solve this. Um, So I'm sure that if I did try and, you know, go after or, or work with some fully insured business. Yes, it's possible some of the bukas may, may restrict it, um, but we haven't run in. Well, that, that's just, that yeah, yet. you know, a democratized, and sometimes that word gets overused, and I don't mean it in a political way, but a democratized way where people can just simply interface and make better decisions. I mean, it's difficult to articulate an argument against that, right? Like, or to say <laughs> no to that, because then it's like, well, what are your vested interests in, in seeing something like that fail, yeah. right? Like, it's hard to say, yeah, no, we're not going to play ball with a solution that helps everybody in the equation. So I mentioned kind of going 10,000, now let's go ground floor. Do sure. you have a specific example of a type of procedure or a maybe a, a use case that you can see works really well where you guys know you just deliver exemplary value to the member? Is there a type of procedure or intervention that you can point to? Specific. Yeah. Very specific. Yeah, please. Um, so we had a very large client uh, come on board about a year and a half ago, 
And one of the things they'd asked us to do is a full analysis of some historical claims. So, and however you feel about historical claims analysis, it, it didn't matter because we weren't using that to learn pricing because we understand contracts change every single year. But we were doing that to show them this is where your spend has been. Yeah. And you kind of create, you know, a heat map of all your, you know, th this are all the CPTs that your members have been seeing. And what we were able to see is that within a specific geo, they actually had a bunch of knee procedures done, like full knee replacements. Um, I think, mm. it, and for the folks that know, please, if I'm wrong, please don't get on me. But it, I think it was a two seven four four seven is the CPT good for a knee replacement. Oh, we're gonna see so much <laughs> screaming, yeah, like everybody's gonna I come after it. you. <laughs> um, Just kidding. But I, I think that's what it was, and we saw for a unit cost, they were paying, you know, for these multiples. I think it was like sixty eight thousand to like ninety two thousand. Yet. We, you know, within our marketplace, within the same facility, had direct contracts with, you know, hardware for 18000 all mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. And it was just an eye-opening experience for the executive team to see this. Yes. Because, again, from the layman's view, just because you're an executive team running a very successful business, and yes, you're administering healthcare you're still a healthcare user on your own. And again, the system's been built to hide all that from mm -hmm. you. You don't know that that's what it actually costs. Mm -hmm. So by opening their eyes to it, one, they're able to make some very um, strategic decisions as to how they're going to, you know, run their plan going forward. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's Well, not that isn't tangible. even just the cost alone is a problem. That doesn't even speak to the necessity of some of those procedures, right? If you see a lot going into one provider, you're like, is this guy or gal just deciding and convincing people to replace their knees, whether or not it was necessary, right? Which is a whole different conversation. But at least, hey, sunlight now. Well, we're shining the light yeah. on this, and, and here's a problem that you need to go solve. Well, that's it. I mean, another, you know, Dutch Rojas statistic, I think he says... And I'm not sure if this is his number or he just used it, but it's, you know, 35% of all healthcare interactions are probably not necessary yeah. to begin with. Yeah. And it's... Well, we can't, we, you start to see a commonality of numbers, right? Whether it's 35% are unnecessary. You know, you hear something around 30 or 40% of maybe surgical procedures are unnecessary. We might have 30, 40% unnecessary spending in our... I mean, it's, it's pretty common right nowadays. So the, I think where there's smoke, there's fire, and it's probably mostly true. I do want to ask you, though, before we skip over the CAA, and then I want to zoom out and go back to big picture and future sure. of this, but what are you guys doing to help these plan sponsors um, stay compliant or, you know, be better fiduciaries of their plan based on what's happening with the CAA coming soon? Yeah, of course. So the, the CAA compliance, you know, is fully – available within the you know the medzoom experience for the members where they have the ability to see within their own network machine readable file what the actual cost of care is mm -hmm. what we've seen our strategic clients do and to me this is the next iteration and this is where that marketplace you know really comes to the front and center is when you can look in that machine readable file and say hey if i go here the unit cost is twenty eight thousand dollars the system itself you know, it's able to search the marketplace that we have access to and give access to those care navigators working with the members mm -hmm. to say, yes, that's the unit price in the network, but we actually have a direct contract. Call us, call your care navigator, Mr. and Mrs. Member. We can get this to you where it costs you zero. Okay. Well, it's what I like about the CAA is one, obviously the exposure, the transparency, yep. but it's kind of putting the onus on the employer now, which, you know, you could argue, is that right to put it on them or not? But by putting it on them, I think it's going to stimulate action, right? Because of the possibility of fines for not being compliant. But two, it's really like, hey, we're giving you the information you now need to make better decisions. You as the fiduciary should be responsible for making those best decisions, right? And so by revealing the info, you now have an action plan to, to take after that. And you're only punished if you don't take action. So, I mean, it's a, again, it seems like it's appropriate in nature as a motivation tool. Um, so are you, now that I have this information, then MedZoom is just allowing those members to shop and yep. they're buy better and make better decisions. But you guys, again, stay totally Switzerland neutral in terms We're of- We're behind what, the scenes. Yeah, which, which is cool, right? It's a good place to be. The That's, members won't even know who we are. Yeah. Because everything we do is white label. Oh, okay. So they don't look like what, the employer logo on the app? Or could what? be the employer, could be the plan administrator, okay. could be the broker. 
what well, whatever they want it to, whatever our clients want it to be for the actual employer group is what we do. I like that, man. Well, so it's really, <laughs> hey, you're, you're getting me pretty excited about it. And I'm sure, obviously, you guys are well, four and a half years in the marketplace. I mean, you're probably mm-hmm. only scratching the surface of the success that you're going to have. It's, it's going to be really interesting to see what this looks like. And I don't mean MedZoom. I mean what this transparency looks like within the in the greater marketplace over the next two years. Mm-hmm. I think... Well, where do you think it's going? That was going to be my follow-up question. It's like, <laughs> put, put, bust out your crystal ball from Atlanta and tell me what uh, tell me what's uh, happening well, in a couple I, years. To me, what I get excited about is this: you have folks like Marshall Allen, folks like, like mm-hmm. guys like you. I mean, doing this podcast and expanding the reach and the the caliber of people that you have, you know, that you get here to sit on this couch and talk Present with you. Company included? <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> I'm no one. Um, it's. It's amazing. And this is what it's going to take. It's almost like a grassroots effort yeah. to educate people. And you do have the power. You can control this cost. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is what it's going to take. And it's everyone working together and collaboration and talking about it mm-hmm. and getting it out in the open. And uh, again, I, I can't wait to continue to share your podcast through my network. Like this, um, man. And so I, what I would say is, I have been more inspired probably in the last six months than I've ever been in my career because it's getting to sit down with people like you. It's one cool solution. Get to meet great people, very successful people that are part of organizations doing good things. But there's an enthusiasm to me that's been palpable this last six, six, 12 months, if you want to say, where I'm just sitting down with people that you just see the mission that they have. They're, they literally are in this to do good. And we're all, even though some of us might be competitors, we can be friendly competitors. We're all trying to steer the ship in the right direction together. And it's just been, it's been fun. It's not like I'm, you know, it's not like we're just talking and talking about, Hey, I have a little bit cheaper rates on my, you know, insurance product. Like that's great. But I think there's a lot of, lot of really good stuff that's happening out there. And, and again, MedZoom is, is, Sounds exact. I don't know enough to be dangerous, but it sounds exactly like you guys fit that mold. So closing thoughts, man. I know you kind of almost delivered a little bit of your closing thoughts or a call to action, but (laughs) folks that have listened to this, this episode, what do you want to leave them with before we jump? Just that continue to work together. It's, it's such a massive problem. And when you look at how it does impact everyone, Mm -hmm. I mean, literally every single person is going to have some sort of healthcare transaction within their lifetime. It's it's just the, the current state cannot continue to go on this way, mm-hmm. and it's continuing to work together with amazing solutions, um, continue innovation. Um, like we probably get painted into a corner as to what we are and what we do, and that's fine. I would love it if 10 more of us come up right behind us because there could be something innovative that they can bring to market that we didn't. Mm -hmm. And overall, it's going to help someone somewhere, not, you know, from a financial perspective. Healthcare is expensive. It doesn't have to be as expensive as it is, though. And, you know, really just, you know, the statistic of one in four people can't afford, you know, a $500 medical bill and they don't get the care they need when you, when you truly just stop and think about it it's it's upsetting yeah and if you can solve that and you know by collaboration together uh it's well i thought when I marshall we was on the show a few months back i i said you know it's like it's kind of one of those things we've got to get enough people a little bit angry about it right and there's a lot of people lamenting how bad the system is we'll get angry about it and get motivated and there are solutions out there that you can deploy and so if i do anything with this podcast it's just be able to highlight those and let people listen in and find out if it's the right solution for them but they're out there and anybody that's offering up these solutions will tell you we can solve this problem we just got enough people to be aware of the solutions being there wholeheartedly believe yeah. it you know what i've the folks that i've met and the rooms that I've been in, which I, at some point in the last four years, I can't even believe I was able to be in the rooms mm-hmm. with some amazing minds like that. The solutions absolutely exist right now today from people in this country to fix and solve healthcare at its core level. They're already here. Yeah, and then lo- listen to the Self-Funded with Spencer podcast to separate the signal from the noise. That's what that's what we're doing here. But, James, I appreciate your travel, man. This has been an absolute pleasure. It's nice to get to know you over this last uh, few weeks as well, and I look forward to releasing this one, man. It's going to be fun. 
I can't thank you enough um, just to be invited. Uh, again, coming to Dallas as a Giants fan a week before, you know, Giants, <laughs> Giants, Cowboys on Thanksgiving. Um, you know, I'm in enemy territory, but uh, no, I, I we'll let you leave with all your fingers <laughs> and toes. Don't worry, man. No, I really appreciate it, and uh, can't wait to see how this continues to evolve for you Thanks, over the man. next year or two. Thanks. All right, talk to you soon, bro. All right, see ya. True Captive believes in healthcare that is personal, an in insurance that isn't complicated. Check them out at truecaptive.com.